Hey guys, Max here, and this is your daily update for yesterday, the 12th of January. We, of course, had CPI data for the US come through, so we're going to cover that, along with just a couple other things that popped up, like some turmoil in China, so let's just get right into it. So as usual, we'll start off briefly with what happened in the markets. So American stocks actually had a pretty decent day. The S&P 500 was up about 0.3% for the day, the Nasdaq was up about 0.2% and the Dow Jones up about 0.1%, so green across the board. It was not a quiet day though, with each of those indexes having a decent start to the day before dropping off a fair bit on the inflation news before once again seeing a nice little rally to take them back up into the green. Now bond yields didn't see much change despite that bad inflation data that we got, mostly because it was already priced in with the increases in yields over the last week or so. Now personally, I'm also of the belief that bond yields and prices aren't reacting to inflation data as most people would expect them to, but they're reacting to policy decisions in response to inflation data. Now this would make perfect sense over the last six months to a year where inflation has been rising very fast, but bond yields haven't been rising in response. It would also make sense regarding the minutes to the FOMC meeting we got the other week, which suggested that the Fed might be more hawkish than earlier thought. Of course, I don't know exactly what is going on with bonds, no one does. I don't know whether this idea is actually correct or not, but I think it's looking more and more likely to be the case each day now. Now, the dollar had a fairly bad day, actually, with the spot index falling by 0.6% across the day and the euro, pound and yen all rising by about 0.7% against the dollar. This is probably an area where the markets are reacting to inflation data. This makes perfect sense. If a currency is seeing loads of inflation, you would usually expect it to devalue compared to other currencies. Now, this hasn't really happened much to the dollar recently, probably because demand for the dollar is just so huge across the rest of the world. It is, of course, the backing behind most central banks and the like, but there was still a reaction today and it's possible that this negative reaction becomes the norm. It's possible that the dollar actually does start to devalue as a result of all this money printing. Now again, this is a hard thing to say or predict whether or not this trend will continue. I personally wouldn't be surprised to see it slide a few more percent over the coming months. Now gold held on to its gains from the day before and actually rose another 0.5% on the day, now sitting at about $1,827 an ounce, seeing a nice little bounce off that inflation data. WTI crude oil saw almost a 2% rise as well, with the price per barrel sitting now at about $83, which is unfortunate for Kathy Wood to say the least. Crypto, on the whole, saw a strong day and rose a few percent across the board. Bitcoin was up 2%, Ethereum was up 3%, and most altcoins were up just a little bit more than that. This bump coincided with a similar bump in risky tech stocks. Some people are looking at this bump as evidence of crypto as an inflation hedge because we had bad inflation news, but personally, I really don't see that. I think if markets were reacting to inflation news, the Nasdaq would have been negative and crypto negative as well. Now that is pretty much it for the markets. As for the actual day, it was of course dominated mostly by the CPI data release and the news surrounding that. So what happened with inflation? Well, it rose. Again, no surprise there. The consensus estimate was 0.5% month over month, but we actually saw 0.6%, so a little bit of a miss there. And then the year over year inflation came through at 7%, which was roughly where it was expected to be. Now, yes, this is bad news. Inflation is still high and it's getting higher. It isn't falling as Biden or the Fed told us it was going to do. And if you've been paying attention, that really shouldn't have surprised you at all. This is now the highest inflation data we've seen for almost 40 years. To get data this high again, we actually have to go all the way back to 1982. But actually, this is far, far worse than that. Of course, it is common knowledge at this point, but the Fed does manipulate the data to try and paint the best possible picture. Now, first of all, they like to talk about core inflation, which excludes food and energy components because apparently they're too volatile. Now, of course, if the aim of this data is to make it visible how much people are being affected by inflation, then taking into account things like energy costs, electricity and gasoline is pretty damn important. And so is taking into account food costs. After all, everyone has to eat. Personally, I really don't like it when people try to look at core inflation and they act like it's the measure we should be watching because it doesn't matter if food prices are historically more volatile. What matters is that everybody needs to eat and higher food costs hurt people. Now, another way the Fed tries to change the narrative is to look at PCE or personal consumption expenditure as opposed to CPI for inflation data. Now, this is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Why? Well, because it's pretty consistently 2 or 3% lower than the CPI data, so it just doesn't look so bad. 
It really is that simple, I'm afraid. Now, the Fed also manipulates the data itself, or I should say the Bureau of Labor Statistics, manipulates the data right at the source by using something called owner's equivalent rent, which is how they measure inflation in the rental market. Now, of course, living in a home is essential. Almost everyone does it. They have to pay rent or a mortgage. And so this really is a very important piece of data. But how is this data gathered? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics literally just go and ask thousands of households if you were to rent your home today, how much do you think it would go for? Now, this is obviously an utterly absurd way to go about getting this data because homeowners who pay a mortgage who don't pay rent don't know how much their home would rent for. Now, this is especially the case when rents have been rising substantially in a short period of time. Homeowners just don't keep up to date with rents on their property. And why would they? It doesn't affect them. Now, the craziest thing about this, though, is that with companies like Zillow and the huge amounts of data regarding rental prices in the country, it would actually be really, really easy for the Bureau of Labor Statistics to get very accurate data regarding rental prices. Now, finally, of course, the Fed has literally changed the way inflation is calculated, and they've done it twice in the past, once in the 80s and once in the 90s. Thankfully, though, we know that they've changed the way the CPI has been calculated, and some people do us a public service by publishing where the data would have been if the Fed had never manipulated the system. A website called Shadowstats does this every month. They recalculate inflation to put it all into a more accurate historical lens. So where would inflation be if the Fed were honest? Well, according to the pre-1990 measure, the CPI would be sitting at about 10.5% at the moment, a full 3.5% higher than what the Fed is telling us. And if we go back even further to the first time the CPI data was manipulated to the 80s, inflation would have been sitting at just over 15% right now, which is utterly absurd. That's over twice the reading that the Fed is giving us. And the craziest thing is that the media is just ignoring this manipulation. You won't hear about this on anything. You won't hear anything about this on a site like Bloomberg or CNBC. They're just pretending that the way CPI was calculated was never changed and they're doing so willingly. Now, I'll link to the Shadow Stats page down below for anyone interested. I really do suggest you check it out. It shows us all perfectly what is really going on. The site really is something special and you can actually support it financially with a subscription, though I have to warn you, it isn't cheap. They do actually track all kinds of different data that's been manipulated by the government from GDP figures to unemployment statistics. The level of fraud that's going on there and has been going on for decades is absolutely ridiculous and people really ought to know about it. Now, in normal news, there is loads of trouble in China, unsurprisingly. Firstly, there are more cases of Omicron popping up and the CCP is starting to worry. In Hong Kong, for example, it's not even enough to wear a mask anymore. You now have to wear two masks, one on top of the other, in what is a pretty desperate attempt to quell the spread of the virus. Xi'an, the city which has been on 100% lockdown for the last few weeks, has just closed two of its hospitals after a scandal about how the hospitals let people die earlier in the pandemic due to their very strict adhering to the COVID rules. Now, this is obviously just going to mean that the already strained healthcare facilities in that city are going to get much worse. The company which owns those hospitals has, of course, taken a hit with their share price dropping 10% on this news instantly. Now, why is the CCP shutting those hospitals down? I don't really know, to be honest. It seems like an awful decision across the board. I understand, sort of, that they want to punish the hospital for doing wrongs in the past, but the wrongs that they did were mandated by the CCP in the first place. The hospitals were following the COVID rules set by the government to a T, and that's why they let people die. So none of this really makes any sense at all, to be honest. Now, there are, of course, more Omicron cases being found in various places around China, in particular in a city called Dalian and another one called Tianjin. Now, these are two very important and very large port cities. They are probably going to get shut down very heavily, which is very bad for the people who live there, but it's also very bad for inflation across the world. Some huge companies like Airbus and Volkswagen have production hubs in these cities, and the supply chain crisis that is already suffering is very likely to just get worse as a result of all this. Inflation in the West and just the rest of the world as a whole is going to get worse. The supply chain crisis is not improving, and thanks to the Fed and other central banks' actions over the last year, demand for products is at all-time highs as well. Of course, the US isn't the only country that lies and manipulates its data. We're seeing the exact same thing happen right now in China, except with unemployment figures. Now, the official unemployment figure lies at about 5% right now, but there are huge problems with that figure. They don't take into account people who have lost their job in the last three months for reasons that I can't work out. 
They don't take into account migrants from rural areas who have recently moved into cities, and they don't take into account people who have lost their jobs as a result of COVID restrictions. Now, this really isn't surprising, especially coming from a country with the CCP running it, but I thought it's worth mentioning anyway, just so that it's clear that the US isn't the only place manipulating statistics. Now again, in China, we did also see another company go tits up as it's about to default. A cruise operator called Genting Hong Kong saw its share price crash 56% in a single day after trading of the stock was halted last week after worries about the company's ability to pay its debts. The debt problem in China goes so much deeper than just property companies and this is a perfect example of that. I've actually got a video script written out regarding this, looking at some other industries in China and their debt problems, and that should come out sometime next week. Finally, we've been talking a lot about stablecoins recently, and Visa is going to join the fray with MasterCard in this fight for central bank digital currencies with plans to help governments develop them. These CBDCs are quickly gaining popularity, and it seems pretty clear, in my opinion at least, that this is going to be a huge industry in the future, so it's definitely something to keep our eye on. Now that is pretty much it for the day. I will see you all again tomorrow. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for all my own investments. There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up, you don't have to buy anything, you don't have to hand over any card information, so if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check it out. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you'll get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.